Hi everybody, welcome to our lecture about strings in the C language today. We are going to start with talking about what a string actually is. And in the C language, a string is a sequence of characters that happen to be contiguously stored. It's not a native type like some sort of int or float um, that we're used to, uh, and in, in more advanced languages, newer languages, string becomes its own type. Certainly in Java, um, we, we can have a C++ string from the STL. We can have all kinds of different uh, formal types for these strings, but in C that's not the case. They just happen to be sequences of characters. And a string is terminated only by the null character that would appear at the end. And that's it. Uh, any other use of these strings is going to require functions and procedures to worry about whether or not there's a null terminator there to know it's the end of a set of contiguous characters. So all of the functions assume this and, uh, and require this in order to, per to actually work. So um, let's take a look at printf here. It's a great example for how this all works. So again, printf is about formatting, is about printing in a formatted manner. So printf is our standard way that we're going to use to send data to standard out. S printf is going to print to a string, uh, some sort of character array, which is again what we're saying a string is. And that's really handy when you're trying to build up a particular string that you're going to return to the user. Uh, instead of having to write it all in one step, you can use multiple steps to combine and concatenate and print together um, you know, some large big string that you want to send out. And finally, F printf prints to a file, so you can send your formatted output directly out to a file. And all these functions are going to require these null terminators to know when to stop. So some of our basic C string functions, our C style string functions here, might be string compare, string comp, which is going to compare two strings for equality. And uh, note the, the call out here, we do not use the double equal sign operator to compare strings. That will compare the pointers and pointers are rarely equivalent. <laughs> so, um, so, so don't use the double equal signs. Uh, everybody's going to make this mistake throughout the term. Um, try to pay attention that you can only compare strings with string comp. Uh, string length here, string len, is going to return the length of the string and characters, and it will it will not include a null terminator that's on there. So if the string string is stored in a C style string, then the string length of that is six, not seven. String copy is how we copy one string into another. String cat concatenates strings, and it, it'll return the string that's a concatenation of itself with another one. Uh, the, so we have some n character versions, so string copy is going to copy only n, or string n copy copies only n characters. But it has some peculiarities here. It will not null terminate a full array. So if you've written out to the ends of that bounds of that array, uh, the string end copy is not going to help you out by putting a null terminator at the end. And it also won't prevent you from overwriting some other array that has real data. It's up to you to use the functions appropriately. And string end cat is going to append only a portion of a string to another. So three different ways to declare these things. The top one there is one that we see very commonly, certainly in our uh, testing programs. Um, then we've got one with square brackets and no asterisk, and then finally no asterisk with square brackets and a number. And are they the same since they all declare a string? And why do we care in operating systems? Well, this one difference here shows how close C is to the underlying memory management that's being performed by Unix, certainly in regards to how it stores the character data inside uh, its virtual memory that's been allocated for the given process. So you need to know this because otherwise you're going to break all the things. So let's talk about this. The first one here is what we call a string literal. And at compile time, it's going to create a sequence of bytes located in the read-only initialized data segment portion of our virtual memory. And the contents of that sequence of bytes in read-only initialized data segment is going to be my string with a null terminator at the end. So when we actually execute the program uh, and, and this particular line is encountered, a pointer on the stack, which is an automatic variable, will be created, and that pointer is called myString. And it points to that read-only sequence of characters that's over in the data segment. 
and uh, that this my string here, this variable that we've created, we can now point that to other addresses if we want. So it does not hold characters. It's just a pointer. We can manipulate this pointer as its own variable to point it to other things. But it starts out by being pointed at the uh, read-only sequence of characters in the data segment. So as an example here, we have a, kind of a standard framework for a program. Here is our my string variable being declared as a char star, and we're directly assigning it a sequences of characters. So what happens is that the my string variable gets created on the stack when this line is encountered during execution. And um, however, when the program was compiled, my string was created in memory. It is created in the read-only portion of the data segment. And that works from the perspective of compiling because this line is fully known by the compiler. There's nothing weird, there's nothing dynamic about this line. So these strings can be picked apart and splatted into the data segment for loading. And that makes it very fast. And again, C is all about speed uh, at the expense of safety. So this is a good thing. For our, our next string here, we simply print that out to verify what's in there. And then we modify the fourth index inside this string. And say we set it to a capital Q. But, as you could expect, that is not allowed. So the first part does go ahead and print it out. But then the second one gives us a seg fault, the, the classic segmentation fault. You're not allowed to do what we just did here because we tried to change memory in the read-only portion of the data segment. So that's where this particular error gets its name from. You attempted to manipulate memory that you do not have the ability to manipulate. It's out of scope for the uh, for where that very for where that memory is actually defined. So let's look at our second one here. When we create this uh, during execution, this is going to create space for uh, 20 bytes. Or no, this is for 10 bytes. Yeah, this creates space for 10 bytes on the stack, um, and this is done as an automatic variable, and again only during execution, not during compilation. And it's going to be named um, my string. So that's the name of our variable here. You Note know, the the non-filled brackets. So the 10 characters comes from you know, 1, 2, 3 is the space, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 is going to be the null terminator. That is all stored for you on the stack as manipulatable memory. So that's going to put this my string into this variable my string with a null terminator, and it's editable as an array. Let's look at the example here. This is the exact same code from before when we had a seg fault, but because we've defined the string differently, we've defined it as being mutable, my string is an array in the same sense that all strings are arrays, and uh, we can manipulate this fourth uh, bucket inside the array. So here we change it. So one, two, three, four, also known as index three. We change it to a capital Q, and it prints out just fine. Here is our third way of doing it. This time we explicitly say how many bytes we are asking for. Um, or in this case, uh, in 20 characters. So this is the type of the array, 20 characters. But because all characters take up one byte, we, know, we happen to know it's also 20 bytes. So this is going to create space for 20 bytes on the stack as an automatic variable. And it's going to have the same name. Otherwise, this is exactly the same as the previous example. You can edit um, this particular array since it has been declared uh, on the stack, not in the um, read-only portion of the data segment. So just to try to reinforce again uh, what's wrong with this particular code, here we define as a char star my string and we set it equal to a sequence of characters and then we copy a new string into the string that we just defined and then print it out. And what's wrong with this? And of course the answer is um, that is uh, the same sort of seg fault we had before. Even though you're using a string copy function, you still cannot overwrite the contents of a string literal. That's in the read-only portion of the initialized data segment. But when did this particular error get caught? And it's only caught at runtime. Uh, seg faults only get triggered at runtime. But it compiles just fine, which is kind of strange if you think about it. Why would this compile just fine? Uh, the compiler is not going deep enough in order to look for this particular kind of error. So it knows that this is a string literal, and then it sees as the very next line a copy that is going to dump data into a string literal, but uh, for some reason it's not caught by, uh, by the, the GCC compiler as we've talked about. 
Let's take a look here at this particular code. This triggers the classic buffer of overrun. So we have a, a array, a string, that we are going to call 5 str, and we'll put in it the value 5. And this particular um, array uh, of value 5 here contains 5 characters, f, i, v, e, and the null terminator is added automatically. When we then string copy in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 characters into it, that seems good, except there's no space for the null terminator. So since this thing is bounded, the string copy function will not create a will not create a null terminator when it writes the data in there. So uh, it goes ahead and uh, splats it in there and uh, doesn't actually hurt the compile step. And not only does it not hurt the compile step, but it won't even be caught as necessarily a runtime error. The only difference is that now we have a sequence of bytes that is not null terminated. So uh, do we, do we, is it going to overwrite something? So if we put in here like 20 characters and we set that into the, these, this particular string, it'll overwrite all of the memory from that starting point and onwards. Is that going to cause a seg fault because we just tried to access some sort of, uh, or some pointer is now pointing to the wrong place and maybe that triggers a seg fault or maybe we've you know, overwritten where the password that we were tracking was being stored. All kinds of chaos can occur because we have used these functions incorrectly. And no seatbelts C is not going to help you. So let's talk about fully initializing our C arrays here. Let's take a look at the string. This particular one is uh, set up as a 20 character array, also known as a string. And we're going to copy in my string. We'll copy that right into it using the string copy function. So here is the results of that. So here's my, the space, string, and the null term terminator that's added. And then we do not know what's in the rest of this particular array. Uh, some compilers will put null terminators in there, but others won't. So others will just leave that memory alone. And the reason for that, of course, is speed. If you, if you don't go through and take the CPU time to set all of those, then your program runs faster. So then we print it out. So our result in this case is going to be my string, because when we print it, the printf function knows to print out only to the null terminator. That's really handy. So the rest of this wasn't displayed, but it's still there. So this little sample program here is going to show us the contents of that entire array. So here's our, our same thing before. We have our my string um, allocated at, twin, at size 20. We are going to loop through that entire array, all 20 characters. Even though we know we've only written 10, we're going to loop through all 20 characters of it. And we're going to print out the character of each bucket as we go through and the decimal equivalent, the ASCII decimal equivalent of it, at the same time. Here's the compilation step. So minus O says here's the output name we're going to use, here's the input file we're going to stuff into it, and that input file name matches what we just output, so we know that the compilation looks successful. It compiles, it runs, and here's the output. It gives us a header line, and then we can see that the spaces are actually character 32. This here Null terminator really is zero. That's where it gets its its name from. It's null. It's zero. There's nothing there. And then the rest of this, or a lot of this, is going to be unprintable. So we see a bunch of null terminator symbols here. For some reason, there's an at symbol at 64. Um, all kinds of chaos uh, occurs inside this array. So in on my computer, when I compiled it, this was the contents of the rest of that array. It was not initialized. It. Uh, for us. This is a great technique for you to use as you write your programs to figure out what's in your arrays. So often garbage in garbage out is, a, is, is going to rear its head as you program but you won't know that you have garbage in and this is one way to check those, those buffers, those arrays, those strings to make sure that it really contains what you think it does. Let's talk about how to properly initialize these things. So Here's kind of a, 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 a bad way to do it, or, or a way to basically not do it. So depending on how you do it, C strings might be full of initialized data, but as, uh, are full of uninitialized data, but as we talked about, some compilers will put things in there. It's still best to clear them before use, though. So in this case, we're going to take the code we had before, and we are going to uh, edit the fourth character to make it be uh, capital Q. And then we're going to wipe out the null terminator and put a pound sign in its place. 
And then at the very end of the array, we're going to slap a null terminator in. This will allow us to print out the entire contents of this particular array to, again, see what's inside it. So now, the, the, another thing we're going to do is we are going to, uh, we're going to analyze every single character inside this array. And if it happens to be a null, ter a null terminator, we are going to replace it with a pound sign. So by doing this, we are going to make the entire array be printable. So as opposed to last time, this slide, where we were printing out uh, everything both as its decimal form and as its character form, in this case, our output is going to be uh, all on one nice line here. And we can see here's the edit as we drag the queue in there, and then here are all the null terminators, and then here are um, you know, just garbage values. Who knows what those particular things are? So again, if you don't initialize, this is what you get. And, uh, and I suppose some of these might have been pound signs originally. Um, they just happened to be displayed, but they, they were probably null terminators. Here is um, a suspicious um, initialization of this particular array. So the contrast here, the previous one, we just define the array, but we never initialize it at all. We don't even set it equal to a, a, to a, a literal. And in this case, we are setting it to a literal. Then we go ahead and run it. The output this time, again, same program, is different. The entire thing got initialized for us. So how portable is that? Is that really going to be the same on the next computer that you compile it? Uh, the compile this on. Is it going to be different using the next compiler that you use? Uh, this is kind of an unsafe way to go about doing things. You don't know what's going to be there, uh, and my claim is that this is not safe. The best way to do this is to yourself initialize that array. So set the uh, declare the array with its size. That gives you the space on the stack. Then go ahead and memset the entire thing. So what memset is going to do here is it's going to take the array that we've declared and it's going to write 20 bytes of null terminators into it. And that matches up with uh, our, or it's not 20 bytes, but 20 instances of this particular character. So it's going to write all 20 characters directly into that string. That sets uh, explicitly the contents of that particular array. So then when we output the whole thing and we get a whole bunch of pound signs, we're not surprised about that because we know we set null terminators there. I highly recommend you memset your arrays before you use them just to clear them out. Sometimes there can be strange characters in there that can even hurt the functions that we're using. So definitely uh, clear them out first. Meanwhile, uh, C is going to continue to give us plenty of rope to hang ourselves with. So the string token function is famous for being difficult to to use but very powerful at the same time. What it does is it splits strings up into chunks and it helps us to to take a sequence of characters that's been entered and pull out um, words based on spaces that are in there. And despite its difficulties, it is sometimes uh, the best or the only tool for the for the job. Certainly when certainly when we're talking about just raw C. So as an example here, we have a, a array that we have declared, and we are initializing it with a particular set of characters. Then this uh, character pointer is created, and we call it token. And here's the string token function. We give it the input, which we have up here. This is my string. And then this particular um, instance of string token is string tokenizer is going to separate the individual words that it returns by any of the following delimiters, space, period, or slash. So it's going to hunt for those. So the first time that this thing returns, the token pointer is going to point to a string that, said, that, that, has, that contains this. The next time we run it, and note that we put null here instead of the, the same input again, that the next time we run it, the token character pointer now points to a string somewhere in memory that contains the word is, so is null terminator. The third time we run it, we get my slash string because we have changed our delimiter for this third time. Uh, maybe we didn't actually want this little slash, who knows, but uh, we'll get the whole thing without, um, uh, without getting tokenized into two additional strings. So pretty neat stuff. So let's take a look at some of the drawbacks of string tokenizer, the string tokenizer in C. We have our input variable and we're going to set it equal to a string, to our string literal here. 
our string literal input, and then we'll run our string tokenizer function against it. And this fails miserably for the same reason that we've been talking about for, uh, for this whole lecture. If you look at the previous slide on this one, we're declaring an array explicitly and giving it an initial assignment. Whereas here, we're declaring this as a string literal. So this particular string is set in read-only memory in the initialized part of the data segment for the virtual memory of this process. And our input char star pointer is declared on the stack as the program runs. But this fails. And it fails because during execution, input is a string literal and the string tokenizer function is going to mess with your strings. It reaches into there and tries to do things to the input. So let's look at this particular code here. Uh, we don't need to study this one too in detail. Um, this just sets up what we're going to do. But basically what it does is it is tracking the contents of the input string as we manipulate it with the string tokenizer function. So here's our input array declared as a full array. We're going to um, set up our token input and then we're going to mem set the whole thing, string copy in our initial value, and we're going to take a look at what it thinks the original string length of this thing is, and then each time through it we're going to print out all of the characters of the array to see what happens to it as successive string tokenizer calls happen. So here's the results. Our input originally is a.b space c slash d, and our token doesn't have it isn't pointing at anything interesting. Then through each successive call, the input string that we passed in is becoming modified. So it's taking our delimiters and each of those delimiters is getting changed. So input gets jacked up as it goes. So I sure hope that there wasn't something important or interesting in there that you cared about for later. So if you needed those, those delimiters, well, tough, they're all gone. This can only work, and as a further horror, this can only work because the string tokenizer function is keeping a hidden variable in that data segment and it's keeping that data variable up to date as it goes. So that makes the entire thing non-reentrant because if that if this thing gets out of sync with what it was doing because it starts initializing somewhere else or the string tokenizer function starts running somewhere else, then the hidden variable uh, is out of sync and you end up replacing or losing the data you had. So looking further about that, not only does it modify the input, but you don't specify which string to tokenize past that first call, which again means hidden variables. So here's our original string that we put in. And the fact that we put null in and we're still getting data out means there's hidden variables. So these mixing of calls as the string tokenizer between different strings uh, becomes not allowed because it can only process one string at a time because it's using those hidden variables. There is a separate reentrant version called string toke underscore r, and it allows you to mix all these calls up, but it requires you to pass in a pointer to a temp variable for it to use as it goes through this. Again, showing its hand, showing you that it really is keeping hidden variables in the background. So a little a little pseudocode method of showing what happens to string tokenizer when you mix them. Uh, here we have our first call to it. And then imagine you call some function, and in that function, you call string tokenizer again with a new input. And then once this function returns, you call string tokenizer again. So this doesn't work because the, in, the string to tokenizer can only manage one at a time. And when you recall it on your input again after the fact, um, the hidden variables aren't tracking what you were doing before. So passing in null is going to cause crashes, or it's not going to return the data you want or it's going to continue to string tokenize off of the input to string. And a solution, of course, is to, you know, if you need reentrancy, you can use the underscore r variant or just use a modern language that has a real string type. So if you're doing heavy, heavy string manipulation, then, you know, consider C++. So if we have all these different declaration methods, what if we combine them? So here we have char star and then the name of our variable, my string, and we're giving it the array index or the array notation of saying three in size. So what this does is it declares an array of pointers, each of which can, is a pointer to a string. 
And each of these pointers can be pointed at to either array names or string literals. You can point them all to different things, because these pointers aren't beholden to the value that they are originally set to. So remember that an array, um, this is a kind of a deep C trivia question, but in C, the name of an array is a pointer to the first element uh, of that element's address in memory. So the, the, the name of the array is a pointer to the first element in memory. So here is our example here. And uh, we'll, we'll go through this one for a couple of minutes here to understand all the nuances. So first declare our important header um, files that we're going to add. We have some tracking numbers that we're going to look at. We're going to declare a, a variable to help us here that the number of elements is 3. And then we're going to declare a string. This is a, a pointer. This is an array of pointers. And we'll form it of size 3. And then we will declare an additional array of size 10 and string copy in a, a particular set of sequences, so one array in this case. And now let's analyze some of the things that we've done. So let's say, what is the size of a character pointer? And we'll try to get as a, a decimal value out of the size of function of a char star. So size of lets us say, how big is a char star on this machine? How big is a char star? So this gets the size of that. Then we're going to say, what is the size of one array element uh, inside this array? So here we say, grab, go ahead and grab me, say, the, the first element in this array. How big is that element by itself? So let's look at that. Then we say, show me, what is the size of all array elements? So in this case, we call size of the mystring variable itself. So without the array indices or markings, it says, tell us what the size of this entire variable is. And then we're going to try to get the number of elements in the array. And before we look at that one, let's look at the output here. So our output, first of all, on this computer, a size of a char star, so a pointer to a character, is 8 bytes. So this is a 64-bit machine, um, because 8 times 8 is 64. Uh, so, and, uh, so that gives us a 64-bit machine in terms of the addresses, because remember, char stars are addresses. So if it takes 8 full bytes to do that, this has to be 8 times 8, which is 64 bits. So the size of one array element is also 8, which makes sense, um, because what our array contains, this is declared as an array of pointers to characters. So these pointers are all 8. They're the same size as just one by itself. The size of the entire array is 24, 3 times 8. So we knew what we put in 3 originally. And each pointer is 8 in size. 3 times 8 is 24. So the size of everything is 24. Now for this last one, we are going to say, all right, let's check equality here between a couple of numbers. So the second one is going to be the number of elements that we originally declared, which was 3. So we're saying, all right, is that 3, you know, we're just going to we're going to visually look to see if these are equivalent. So is this 3 equal to um, this other uh, expression here? So our expression here consists of the size of the entire my string variable. Then take that thing and divide it by the size of one of the elements in it. And we know from what we saw that 24 divided by 8 is going to give us 3. And sure enough, that's what our output says. 3 is equal to 3. So that, that makes sense. Um, and this is one of the classic ways to figure out uh, how many elements are in an array. So if you didn't have, for example, the way, if you didn't know how many were in there, then you could take a look at the size of the entire thing divided by the size of one of the elements and that would tell you the number of elements in that array. Okay, so then looking through some other code here and this just outputs uh, some further interesting uh, some further interesting text. If we take the first element in our my string array of pointers to strings and set it equal to some string literal, that succeeds. That's not a problem. Then we can print it out then we can set that same uh, string literal again equal to a pointer to an array. So remember, um, my string uh, subscript 0 is a pointer to a character. And the name of an array is also a pointer to a character as the, or the beginning of a string. So I can set that equivalently uh, as an assignment to my string 0. These are both char stars. And then I can print this thing out again. 
So when I do this, we can see that the first element of the MyString array uh, contains the string literal pointer, so a pointer to a sequence of characters in memory. And then I can change where that string is pointing to another uh, set of characters. So note that I am not assigning new character values to this array. I am changing where the pointer points to. So somewhere else is declared a big set of characters contiguously stored in memory with null terminators. And I am changing which of those swaths of contiguous characters that I'm pointing at by modifying um, the individual arrays here. So uh, again, looking back at this combining the declaration method slide, we can change the pointer, we can change where the pointers point. But how do we create new strings for this array to hold? And we do that with malloc, which stands for memory allocate or memory allocation, and free, which frees that memory. So here's a sample program to dynamically allocate a string. We have some header material at the top, then we have um, our uh, in, first thing in our function, we're going to define a pointer to a character, which is the same thing as a pointer to a string. Then we're going to define another one and make it be a string literal. So this particular, um, th where this address points cannot be modified. So then we're going to take my string, which we haven't even given bounds to, it's just a pointer to nothing right now. And we're going to call malloc and we're going to say, malloc, give me 20 size of characters. And size of char, as we talked about, always is going to return one. It's kind of a tautology. But that's important because we intend to use my string for characters. So I want to say I want 20 characters. And if this was going to be a um, oh, an array of integers, then I would need to do 20 times size of integers so that I would get enough bytes allocated in memory. What malloc returns is a pointer to the memory that was just created on the heap. Remember that dynamically allocated memory is on the heap, not the stack. It's not automatic. We have to keep track of this memory ourselves. So I take that pointer and then assign it to our pointer here. Some uh, error code. If my string was zero, then bail out. And then memset that memory that was just given to us, because who knows what malloc did. Did malloc actually initialize it, or did malloc just um, you know, give a bunch of null terminators, or did it actually just give us the memory quick and fast and didn't empty it first? So then we're going to string print f into this thing. So we take, here's where we're going to dump the data we're about to, to print f. Then here's the, the terms. So yay, and then here we have a field, the string field that we're going to grab from our literal that we defined up here. And then print that thing out, change the fourth element to q, print it out again and then free the memory. So the output, uh, so it compiles just fine. Then we can see that we can uh, assign data to it and then we can change that data later. Down here at the bottom, uh, that free is really important because if we don't manage to free that, then we get memory leaks. So a memory leak is memory that you've lost track of, memory that is still taking up space, um, but you're not actually using at the moment. So if you've got a, a really long program, like a server process, uh, that could eventually use up all of the memory that you have available to you for your process. Or it could even fill up the entire virtual memory space of the computer, depending on if the memory, if the various processes that are running have bounds for their memory, um, if the operating system, if the operating system is set up such that it can write memory down to the hard drive when RAM is filled, then you could start filling up those temporary um, paging files on the hard drive as well, so you could really have a major, major leak on your hands. One interesting thing is that all that process memory gets freed up when the process gets terminated, right? So if that's the case, then why do we care about memory leaks? And again, the reason we care is that for a long running program, you could eventually use up all your memory. Uh, you'll be a, a poor citizen of that particular computer. Now this, this uh, element about or this fact about that the memory is going to be cleared automatically for you, so you don't have to worry about the memory leaks, that's only true on these big modern operating systems. Some of the special embedded lightweight real-time operating systems won't do that. So a memory leak really can eventually torpedo the hardware. So here's a very classic way to hide and generate a leak. So imagine that I, uh, I'm going to malloc some memory here. So here's my char star, and it's uh, my, my pointer to a character. And I'm going to malloc in a sequence of bytes that are f good for 20 characters. 
And then, you know, other code happens, maybe big long function calls and a bunch of other stuff. And then eventually I think, you know that my string, I, I'm going to set that equal to another variable and continue on my way. So what we've done is that we have lost the address that points to where this memory was allocated. The only place that our address was, the only address that we had that was pointing to that was stored in my string, and we have just changed the address that was in there to some other random literal. So that ad address is gone. Well, there's no way for us to reclaim that without killing off the process and restarting it. So one interesting thing is that then later, if you say, well, you know, I'll just call free on my string. Maybe it's, I don't know, somehow retained memory or something of what was in there. And it doesn't. It's going to fail spectacularly because it will try to free memory that was not on the heap. Let's take a look at what happens when we do that. So here's the same bit of code that we had before. But in this case, we are going to sneak in a reassignment of our my string variable to be equal to some literal string here. What does it do? It is a spectacular crash. So we get um, the first two lines print out just fine, but then we have this error in malloc test, you know, freeing some invalid pointer you weren't supposed to do, and then it dumps the backtrace of where it was on the stack, and then all of the memory contents, including a bunch of contents of different um, libraries that were in use, and then finally we get this, ab this horrible aborted core dumped message at the end. Uh, totally, totally bad, and it's tracking the contents of the heap and all kinds of bad stuff. So. So be careful of those memory leaks, be careful of strings that you reassign, and uh, they won't have to make you a new starship. All right, I hope this was instructive, that you were able to learn some things about strings in the C language, and uh, we will see you on the discussion boards. Thanks.